Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 8. And now it came to pass after David smote the Philistines and subdued them. David took Metheg Amma out of the hands of the Philistines. Metheg Amma is a, another name, it is a Hebrew name for the uh, city of Gath because of the position of the city from a geographical standpoint. Uh, it was called Mithagama. But uh, the common name by which we know the city is Gath. It is the Philistine city to which David had sought refuge. It was one of the most powerful of the Philistine city. By the taking of Gath, he was pretty much in control over the Philistines. They were pretty well subdued by David. Uh, being a walled city uh, and one of the major cities of the Philistines, it speaks much of, of the power of David's army at this time. Uh, walled cities often were never taken by direct assault. Most generally, uh, they were uh, taken by a prolonged uh, siege, starving the people out, and uh, then uh, after you starve them into the point of surrender. Uh, but uh, it shows David's prowess in war to be able to take this walled city of Gath. And then he smote Moab. Now, uh, he then it says, measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground, or making them lie on the ground, actually, even with two lines measured out, he put to death and with one full line to keep alive. So the Moabites became David's servants and they then uh, became tributaries. What he did is he took the men and he made them lie on the, uh, on the, on the ground in lines. Uh, and one line was measured for death uh, and uh, the other were allowed to live. The Midrash, Hebrew writings uh, declared that the king of Moab after David came into power put his parents to death and that is their explanation why David was so cruel in killing the captives of war. Uh, he had taken and captured these men in the battle and then made them lie down face on the ground and drew the line and on this side they were slain this other side they were allowed to live but those that did live became uh, a, tr a tributary to David. David then also smote had, uh, had an Ezer. Now this is up in the area now of Syria so he has moved to the south and west conquering Moab. He has moved uh, towards the or south and east conquering Moab. He's moved towards the West conquering the Philistines, and now he is moving northward in the conquering of the area of Syria. And so Rehob, the son of Zobah, as he went to recover his border at the river Euphrates, he expands now his kingdom tremendously. David took from him a thousand chariots, 700 horsemen, and 20,000 footmen. And David hewed all of the chariot horses, but he reserved of them, uh, of the horses, enough for a hundred chariots. And when the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, the king of Zobah, Zobah was actually in the area of Syria, uh, and one of the Syrian, there were several capitals at that time, David slew of the Syrians 22,000 men. And then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus and the Syrians became the servants to David and brought gifts and the Lord preserved David wherever he went. So we see the kingdom arising tremendous to tremendous strength. We see David uh, conquering and establishing uh, the kingdom. And then David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadadezer, and they, he brought them to Jerusalem. And from Bita he, and from 
uh, Berothai, the cities of Hadadezer, the king David took a lot of brass. He is now beginning to gather the wealth for the building of the temple. God said to David, you can't build the temple. Your son will rise to build it. But David in his heart said, well, he didn't say I couldn't gather the materials. And so David started to gather the gold, the silver, and the brass. And you remember that uh, in the building of the temple, and we'll come to that later on, when Solomon built the temple, he had this huge brass uh, bath, they called it, the huge laver in which the priests were to bathe. Uh, he also had in the temple those two columns, those pillars of brass. And so David took this brass uh, from uh, the cities of Hadadezer. And then when Toy, the king of Hamath, heard that David had smitten all of the host of Hadadezer, then Toy sent to Joram his son unto King David to greet him and to bless him. Because Hadadezer had actually uh, fought against and had uh, gov given a lot of damage to Toy. And so uh, Joram brought with him vessels of silver, vessels of gold, and vessels of brass, which also King David did dedicate unto the Lord with the silver and gold that he had dedicated of all the nations which he had subdued. So gathering together now, tremendous amount of gold, silver, brass, and of Syria and of Moab and of the children of Ammon and of the Philistines and of Amalek and of the spoil of Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, the king of Zobah. And David got him a name when he returned from the smiting of the Syrians in the Valley of Salt, being 18,000 men, and he put garrisons in Edom. So he even moved further south and to the east in conquering Edom. And throughout all of Edom he put garrisons, and all they of Edom became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David, we hear this twice now, wherever he went. And David reigned over all of Israel, and David executed judgment and justice unto all of his people. And Joab, the son of Zariah, was over the armies. Jehoshaphat was the recorder. Zadok, the son of Ahitab, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were the priest. And Zariah was the secretary of state. He was the scribe. And uh, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over both the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and David's sons were the chief rulers. So we see now the kingdom coming to the zenith of its power, of its glory. David has conquered the enemies round about. He has now set things in order. Things are going great. They're going well. The kingdom is strong. Joab is over his armies. Jehoshaphat is the chief historian. And the priesthood is established. At this point, David remembered a covenant that he had made with Jonathan, the son of Saul. Turning back to 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 12. And Jonathan said unto David, O Lord God of Israel, when I have sounded my father about tomorrow, any time or the third day, and behold, if there is good toward David, and, then, uh, and I then send not unto thee and show it to thee. And the Lord do so much more to Jonathan. And so in verse 14, And you shall not only while I am still alive show me kindness of the Lord that I die not, but also... Thou shalt not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. Now this is the position David is in. God has cut off his enemies all around him. He's, you know, no one is strong enough really to make war with David at this point. He's, the enemies are cut off. And so Jonathan said at that point, Show kindness to my house forever. 
So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan caused David to swear again, because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. And so uh, this was the covenant that was made between Jonathan and David, that David would show kindness unto Jonathan, and if Jonathan should be dead, then he would never cease to show kindness to the house of Jonathan. David is strong, he's established, he remembers this covenant with his friend Jonathan. And so David searches to find out if there is any of the house of Saul who are still alive that I may show him kindness, he said, for Jonathan's sake, to keep this vow. And there was of the house of Saul a servant, whose name was Ziba, and they called him unto David, and the king said, Are you Ziba? And he said, Your servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God, remember the covenant was the kindness of the Lord unto them, that I may show the kindness of God unto him. And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan has yet a son which is lame in his feet. Mephibosheth was a young son of Jonathan at the time that Jonathan was slain on Mount Gilboa. When news came to Jerusalem that Saul and his sons were slain, the nurse of Mephibosheth grabbed the child and fled for the child's safety and for his life. As she was fleeing, she dropped him, probably on his back, on his spine. And as the result of being dropped, he became lame in his feet. And so Ziba said, there's still this one son of Jonathan, Mephibosheth. Now, the nurse fled when he was just five years old, and by this time Mephibosheth has children of his own. So several years have transpired in the interim. And the king said unto him, where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Uh, now, you have to get you out a Bible map to find Lobidar, Lodibar, but it's over on the other side of the Jordan River in the area of Gilead, where they often fled. It was sort of a place of protection. Uh, the tribes of Manasseh and uh, Gad and Reuben had settled on the other side of the Jordan River, but they really were never unified strongly with Israel. So whenever anybody was in trouble, they'd usually flee across the Jordan River over into the area of Gilead. This is where the nurse took the child. Now, this name is interesting, and it becomes significant. Macher, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. He took Mephibosheth and protected him, sort of raised him, took care of him as Mephibosheth grew. No doubt was very close and had a strong tie with Mephibosheth. Later on, when Absalom rebelled against David, and drove David out of the kingdom. David also fled to the area of Gilead. It was, as I say, the, the place where they'd usually flee. Get across the Jordan River, you have a natural defense, a natural barrier against your enemies. David also fled to the area of Gibeon and with his people. And we read that this same fellow brought to David and to his people a lot of supplies. He helped them. He supplied them. No doubt in response to David's kindness to Mephibosheth. And so what David 
did in helping Mephibosheth actually came back to him later from the same man who, uh, when we get there, we'll, we'll make note of that again and we'll come back to this. We'll cross-reference these when we get uh, to David's flight from Absalom. It's the same man that helps David uh, when he is fleeing from Absalom. So King David sent and they fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come to David, he fell on his face and did obeisance. And David said, Mephibosheth. And, you know, it's, it's sort of sad in a way that we can't, with a printed word, pick up expression. You know, it's, how you say a person's name many times. Whether or not it brings comfort or terror. Now, my parents had a way of saying Charles <laughs> that brought terror. <laughs> and they also had a way of saying Charles which brought comfort. I could know what their attitude was by the way they said my name. And you know if you're in trouble or if everything's okay, just the way they say your name. I believe that it's sad that we can't put expression on the printed page so that we could hear David saying, Mephibosheth. I think that there was all kinds of love. David was thinking of Jonathan. He was thinking of how much he loved Jonathan. Here is the son of Jonathan. Oh, you know, he can now fulfill his... his Desire and vow to Jonathan Mephibosheth. You know, just the excitement, the love, and in the voice of David is all of the comfort. And though Mephibosheth may have been uncertain, may have been fearful, he didn't know but what David's looking for the rest of Saul's descendants to exterminate them, to take away any threat of any uprising in the future, any endeavor to restore Saul's kingdom. And so he bows before David. He's fearful. And David, I'm sure, dispelled it all when he said, Mephibosheth. And just the love, the, the warmth, and all that was there. And he said, Behold your servant. And David said, Don't be afraid. Fear not. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake and will restore to you all of the land of Saul your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Here, of course, we see David in a allegory in the likeness of God, seeking the lost, showing kindness and grace, to the lost, as he restores to him all that belonged to the family inheritance. And he does it all for Jonathan's sake, because of his love for Jonathan. And so we see Jesus coming from God to seek and to save that which was lost. And we see God reaching out to lost mankind, drawing them to himself, saying, don't be afraid. I will show you kindness. I will restore unto you all that's been lost, all that belonged to your father. And you will eat at my table continually. Beautiful, beautiful picture of God's love for us in Christ. And it's all done for us for Christ's sake. For his sake, God forgave my sins. For his sake, God called me to be his child. For his sake, I can come and sit at the table of God. Again, so many times people misunderstand God and misread God, thinking that God is angry thinking that God is wanting to judge or wanting to condemn or wanting to destroy. That God is wanting to forgive and bestow His grace and mercy upon you 
for Jesus' sake. And all that God does and has given to us is given for Jesus' sake. And that's why we so often as we pray, we say, Father, for Jesus' sake. Because there is my entrance. There is the opening. It's for Jesus' sake. It's not for my sake. It's for Jesus' sake that God is gracious to me. It's not that I deserve. It's not that I am worthy. I would not presume to come to God upon that basis because I might get what I deserve. I come in Jesus' name to receive the grace of God that is extended to me for Jesus' sake. I love that restoring. That's the work of Christ, the restoration. That's always the work of God, restoring. You know, the years of sin can take their toll. Guy can mess up his life, mess up his body, mess up his family. But that restoring, God said to Joel, I think it was, I will restore the years that the canker worm have eaten. Caterpillar. And, and how glorious it is when we come to Christ. He, he restores those wasted years of our lives. It's beautiful to see God's work of restoration in a life. I remember when Mike McIntosh first came around. A lot of you probably remember that too. Poor Mike. He was as spacey as they come. That he had a violent reaction to a large dose of LSD laced with strychnine. And he was just sort of in this fuzzy world of non-reality. He thought that the back, head of his, back of his head was blown off. He was sure that there was a big cavity back here and the back end of his head was blown off. And he walked around here rather spacey for quite some time. But he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. His family, his wife, she had left him with, the, with the, their little girl Mindy. She couldn't handle him anymore. He was just too spaced out. Life was a wreck. Life was a mess. At the end of the road. And he came and he found Jesus Christ. And God began the work of restoring. Putting it back together. His mind his body, physically, mentally, as well as spiritually. I remember the day that we remarried Mike and Sandy. Little Mindy was a flower girl, beautiful little flower girl. I mean, we had to stop the ceremony several times just to cry. <laughs> it was so beautiful. Because we, had, we were seeing before our very eyes the work of God's restoration. We were seeing what God could do in putting a man's life back together again, in restoring his sanity, in restoring his family, in restoring all that the enemy had ripped off. For the enemy has come to rob, kill, and destroy, and Mike was almost destroyed. I'll tell you, when I go down to San Diego today and I go on that 22-acre campus that he has and I see the school and I see the marvelous work, I see the mission outreach that is reaching out to a world, I see a smooth, well-run organization, I see thousands of young people and older people gathering to worship, my heart just fills and swells with Joy as I see God's work of restoration taking a wreck, a social wreck, a social outcast, one that was written off by the psychiatrist. They said that kid will never come out of it. You know, he's through. It's over. It's finished. 
but to see that work of God's restoration. And so we have the beautiful picture with David as he brings Mephibosheth. He said, I want to restore to you all, all that was your father Saul's. But you, you're going to eat at my table continually. Mephibosheth bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? You know, who am I? And there again you have it. Who am I that God should bestow upon me such grace, such love, such goodness? Paul asked five pertinent questions in the end of Romans chapter 8. If God be for us, who shall be against us? Or who can be against us? God's for me. Praise the Lord. Secondly, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Well, if God be for me, who can be against me? For if God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how much more shall he not freely give us all things? God is so willing, so ready to give to you anything you need. He's already given his son. How much more will he freely give us anything, everything that we might need? Secondly, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who is justified. God's not laying any charges against you. Third, who is he that condemneth? Not Jesus. He died. Yea, rather is risen again and is even at the right hand of the Father making intercession. Then fourthly, who then shall separate us from the love of God? I mean, God's for me. <laughs> He's justified me. Jesus is interceding for me. Therefore, who can separate me from this love of God? Persecution, peril, nakedness, sore, nay. And all of these things I'm more than a conqueror through him who loved me. For I'm persuaded in neither height nor depth, principality nor power, things present, things to come, nor any other created thing is able to separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus my Lord. The fifth question I always like to leave to last though it was the first question that Paul asked. But Paul was thinking of these others when he asked the first question. The first question is, what shall we say to these things? What can you say to these things? God's for me. God loves me. God has justified me. Jesus is interceding for me. The Holy Spirit has strengthened me. Nothing can separate me from God's love. What can you say or what shall we say to these things? I don't know what to say to these things. I don't have any words to say. All I can say is, wow, but that's not much. <laughs> you know, you think of it, you say, wow. You know, you're sort of speechless. Wow is sort of a word that expresses <laughs> that I don't have anything to express with, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's just a word you use when you, when you don't know how to express yourself. It's just a word of awe, wonder. And I'm always standing in awe and wonder of God's grace to me for Jesus' sake. And here's poor Mephibosheth, not knowing but what maybe he was going to be executed, and he finds, hey, man, look what's happened. You know, everything is restored to me, and I'm to sit at David's table. I've been made a part of David's family. Who am I? That you would take note, I'm just a dead dog, man. And yet, look what you've done for me. And then the king called Ziba, this servant of Saul's previously, and said to him, I have given unto your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all of his house. Now, therefore, you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and you shall bring in the fruits that your master's son may have food to eat but Mephibosheth thy master's son shall eat bread always at my table now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants then said Ziba unto the king according to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servants so shall thy servant do now, 
Don't think that Ziba is a nice guy. He's only obeying the king, but he turns out to be a rat. We'll find out that later. Again, when Absalom drives David from the kingdom, and David has been driven out, Ziba comes to David and he said, and David said, where is Mephibosheth? And he said, well, when he saw that Absalom drove you out, he stayed back. He didn't want to come. He said, now Israel will put me on the throne and make me king again, you know. It was an outright lie of Ziba to David to turn him against Mephibosheth. And so David said to Ziba, all right, then you and your family can have it all, you know. All that I gave to Mephibosheth, you know, you can take it. But then when David came back and Mephibosheth said, Oh, David, I wanted to come, but I'm lame. I couldn't run, and, and so I had to stay. And, and David realized that he'd been, you know, snookered, and Ziba got it. So uh, anyhow, uh, he had to till the ground, take care of it, but as for Mephibosheth, he was to sit at David's table. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table, but he was lame in both of his feet. Now in chapter 10, we find that the came to pass after this that the king of the children of Ammon died. And Hanum his son was reigning in his place. So David thought that he would show kindness unto Hanum, the son of Nahash, inasmuch as Nahash his father had showed kindness to David. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his father. So he sent servants over to attend the funeral and to give David's regards. It was sort of a um, matter of state politics. And David's servants came to the land of the children of Ammon. And the princes of the children of Ammon said unto Hanum their lord, Do you really think that David is seeking to honor your father? That he has sent comforters to you? Don't be Fooled, man. David has sent these servants to spy out the city, to search it out, to look for the weaknesses, because he's going to send his armies to invade and to overthrow it. Therefore, Hanum took David's servants and shaved off half of their beards. The Only slaves shaved, and it was a part of the sign of a man was a slave, is that he was shaved. So it, it, was, it was an easy way to identify a slave or a runaway slave. A guy is shaven, you know that he's been a slave, and, and he's running. He's, because it takes a while to grow a beard. The only way you could you know, get by running away as a slave would be to hide someplace until your beard grew, and then they wouldn't know but what you know, you were a master somewhere. And so in cutting off half of their beards, it was a, it was a dastardly kind of a thing. It was to uh, shame them and uh, make them appear as, as slaves. And of course, not only that, he took their outer robe and uh, cut it off at the level of their buttocks. And uh, so they were greatly ashamed. And it, uh, they told David... Uh, what they had done to his servants. And so David said to them, you guys just wait in Jericho till your beards grow back, uh, and uh, then you can return. And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, old English word, <laughs> stink, stank, stunk. It's like Latin. Eek, hi, coke. 
the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen, and of King Maka, a thousand men, and of Ishtab, 12,000 men. So 33,000 men, mercenaries, professional soldiers, were hired by uh, this young man, uh, Hanum, that had taken over the throne of his father, uh, Nahash, in Ammon. And so when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all of the host of mighty men. And the children of Ammon came out and they set up their battle array at the entering end of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah and of Rehob and Ishtab and Makkah were by themselves in the field. Actually, they were marching down, they, and as Joab got there, they had not yet quite arrived. And Joab's purpose was to drive a wedge to keep them from joining forces. And when Joab saw that the front of the battle was against him before and behind, he chose all of the choice men of Israel, and he put them in array against the Syrians. These guys were the mercenaries, the toughest ones, the rest of the people he delivered to the hand of Abishai, his brother, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. So they're facing the two forces, those of Ammon and those of the Syrians. And so he divides the troops. He takes the finest of the troops to face the Syrians, uh, knowing that they are the stronger of the two, while he puts uh, his uh, brother uh, Abishai against the Ammonites. And he said, if the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the children of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will come and help you. And then he said to his men, be of good courage and let us be men for our people. He realized that this is a very serious thing. If, if the Syrians start to uh, overcome his men, then it will inspire the men of Ammon who will then attack Abishai and the weaker group. So he says to them, okay, you guys, let's be men, let's be strong. You know, it's going to be a tough one, but let's go for it. And for the cities of our God and the Lord do what seemeth good. And Joab drew near and the people that were with him under the battle against the Syrians and the Syrians began to flee from them. And when the children of Ammon saw that the Syrians were fled, then they fled also before Abishai, and they entered into their city. They were pretty well near their city. They saw the Syrians splitting, and so they went running back within the shelter of the walled city of Ammon. So Joab returned. He didn't try to take Ammon. Uh, but he just returned uh, from the children of Ammon and came back to Jerusalem. And when the Syrians saw that they were smitten before Israel, then they gathered a whole big army together. And Hadadezer sent and brought out the Syrians that were beyond the river, and they came to Helam, and Shobach, the captain of the host of Hadadezer, went before them. And it was told David, and so he gathered all of Israel together and he passed over Jordan and came to Helam and the Syrians set themselves in array. Now, David probably was a little upset with Joab for not taking Ammon. Joab just came back, didn't wipe out the enemy completely. So David takes charge of this battle. He was a brilliant general. Fabulous in warfare. And so David took charge of the troops in going against the Syrians. And the Syrians set themselves in an array against David, and David fought with them. And the Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians, 40,000 horsemen. And he smote the leaders, Shobah, and the captain of their host who died there. And when all of the kings that were the servants to Adrezer saw that they were smitten before Israel, they made peace with Israel and they served them. So the Syrians feared to help the children of Ammon anymore. So we've now come to the apex. 
This is it. The greatest strength, the greatest time of strength in the nation. David is well established. He is strong. It is interesting that it is at this place of greatest strength that David gets wiped out. You know, danger, there's probably greater danger in success than almost anything else. When you finally are very successful, everybody is singing your praises. Everybody is just, you know, hailing the chief, you know, and, and how great you are. Watch out for success because that is a place of extreme danger as we will discover next Sunday night as we move on into the next portion of this book and we see how David fell at the place of greatest strength. You can read ahead. You got the book. And now may the Lord be with you to keep you in his love to watch over you. And may you enjoy the kindness and the goodness of God given to us through Jesus Christ and for his sake. May you enjoy sitting at his table this week and just partaking of the richness and the fullness of God's grace, mercy, and love towards you in Christ.